Do you know what? I don't know how my mouth. Oh, I don't know how most girls do it because my hair clearly can just go one way. Otherwise, looking like Spanish bull. This is just gonna have to do because. Yeah, you know, can't get much worse, can it, really? Not sponsored. Yeah. My head's like half cropped. Hello and welcome. Oh, it's really dark as well. I don't know how I'm going to fix this. I think I'm just going to have to leave it. Hello and welcome to another video. I hope my armpits uh no idea with it. <laughs> Welcome to another video. If you're new to my channel, um, I'm pretty much new to it too to be honest because what the fuck have I been doing? But my name is Charlotte, I don't actually even think I've introduced my name on, on myself <laughs> um, on my other video so that's really good. But my name's Charlotte and I am in recovery um, from anorexia. So my eating disorder um, has been in my life for a solid 10 years now um it started when i was 20 no it didn't <laughs> my eating disorder i guess sort of started when i was around 12 years old and i'm now 25 turning 26 can't believe it and whilst i'm in a lot better place in regards to where i am in or with my illness um it's still something that is very much a part of my life and i've said it before in other videos that this is something that i'm accepted that I'm learning to live with um, and it's just how I better manage it and things like that. But this channel specifically, this is looking into what it's like to be in recovery, the highs and the lows, sharing my personal experiences um, when I was in treatment, um, other eating disorders that have come in with my anorexia. But essentially I want this to be a place um, which is kind of like a big community, uh, both for the sufferers, carers, loved ones, friends, families, whoever medical professionals, as well as sort of like a teaching platform um, for the treatment for anorexia, which is sort of my, well, not sort of, it definitely is my main goal in regards to what I want to achieve um, for my career and in life. And that is to better the treatment um, for anorexia um, and other eating disorders as well. Um, obviously being more specific to what I've experienced um, but eating disorders in general as well and the treatment process and how we can better that overall as a service um, and what's currently available that is my main 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 thing and to get the education of eating disorders anorexia as well um, out there and spoken about and taught about because I think we we are coming to realise how much this is not spoken about um, and although it's getting a lot better um, which is great I feel like especially with the pandemic over the last year or so um, numbers and figures are obviously escalating and it's becoming so much more of a problem um, and we need to fix it point blank we need to fix it and hopefully I can give this justice or bring light to this in some sort of way and I was sort of umming and ahhing about where to start and so I had all these ideas in my head about what I wanted to achieve and what I want to discuss um, but I was just getting so overwhelmed with all of those I kept on diving in to each different category and then just it all in all not becoming a success so I thought what better way um, than to start with statistics because you know that's what we sort of live for in this world and that's sort of what's projected into um, society and in social media. Um, and I, even for someone who suffered with a disorder, it still completely amazes me how unaware we are and how little, I guess, it's brought to the front line. Um, I actually put some, a few statistics on my Instagram page. It's just incredible what isn't being done and, and what isn't known because there are some things that really just shook me and I was like I'm totally not aware of this and this is why it's so important like even with me with the with my eating disorder and having previously suffered severely with anorexia the stuff that I don't know and the stuff that still isn't projected is quite concerning so this is what we're gonna do 
I'm going to start with the statistics. Um, obviously, I can't cover all of them. And if I do miss any, please, please, please comment below um, because I think feel like it's really important that we do discuss these topics and we get them out there. And if there's something that's important to you and that you know and I haven't picked up on, bring it out. Bring out this is what we need to do and this is how we can spread the word and find areas that need improving. So, basically, and if you see me looking down, it's because I have a script like... I've got to plan this shit out. It doesn't always come to fruition, but it's on my laptop. I've written out my script and that's what I'm going off because that's what I do. And I'll probably go off on a tangent like I am now. So we'll see how we go. This isn't just about slandering things. This is also highlighting the beneficial areas. Um, but obviously in this particular video, it's um, we're looking at figures. And although there's some relatively positive ones, I think it's important how um, or to identify how we interpret statistics as well because although there can be numbers that seem quite good um, it's all about what kind of makes up that value um, and what it actually represents. I'll probably talk about them in a couple of them because some of them are actually quite important for that point but we're just going to roll with it. I'm going to give you some basic statistics both on eating disorders in general um, as well as anorexia specifically. As I do do more videos um, I will start to discuss things that I have, other eating disorders that I have experienced um, in my journey um, and do still occur um, and I think I've said in a previous video about um, the education of exercise and recovery but that's something that I'm going to cover in a whole other thing because I could go on about this, this forever um, and it's quite a controversial topic so we're going to leave that for another day but yeah as I say as I do more videos you'll come to like know sort of what I've experienced and um, what I'm about what I do and who I am I guess and that's something that I also want for this channel to have is that community and getting to know each other even though you'll see me talking on the screen I will bring points to, to light because this is what it's all about and this is what I'm trying to change um, for the better. So there we go. Off on a tangent again. This is not going to be less than 15 minutes. I'm really trying but I feel like I'm already like 700 minutes in. Also point to make, I know obviously YouTube is a global situation um, but these are the general UK statistics um, as I just wanted to sort of focus on I was looking more specifically into what my country offers um, currently and the problem areas in there and the services in there and that's sort of what I'm looking to change um, but we can totally do this on a broader spectrum 100% I think it's important as well to show the overall value but for the for the sake of this video it is to do with you take you take who's there what <laughs> but yeah just so you're not like well that's a lie could be a lie. I don't know what they feed us. Now the information that I will be sharing with you today I have found through, through, <laughs> through multiple uh, websites. This including um, eating disorder specific ones, so things such as BEAT, um, as well as NICE guidelines too, um, and then articles and research and things like that. Um, but like I said I can't cover it all, I haven't covered it all, but it's just in this like a snippet of statistics and a snippet of what the extent of the problem, I guess. <laughs> let's just get into the video and see how we get on. Okay, so let's just generally start with the eating disorder prevalence in the UK. So according to the research I found, there are around 1.25 million people in the UK that are suffering with an eating disorder. Um, and to me, it seems like this could be, and it has even, said in the literature that um this is probably an underestimation um pretty much i'd say for two main reasons the one reason is that these statistics appear to relate back to 2017 so just in itself being backdated there could be an influx purely based on time period and we know that obviously with the pandemic um things have really exacerbated and people may have relapsed um in the, in the case of isolation um, and circumstances. Um, so that's something that we definitely need to consider as well. And also like just in general of this disorder, the likelihood of unreported cases, um, whether that's just from people not seeking help or just not being reported and things like that. So that's something that we always need to consider with this. Um, so it's likely an underestimation. So definitely something to be aware of. 
so the next point which I still feel like is super un undervalued and I don't know why it's so it's just not taken as impactive I don't know as as other ones um but this is about eating disorders having the highest mortality rate amongst psychiatric disorders and anorexia specifically having the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric disorder um, in adolescence. It also has a similar incidence rate as type 1 diabetes which I think is something that shocked me um, and should shock a lot of people because we talk about diabetes both type 1 and type 2 um, maybe type 2 is a little bit more known because of the obesity epidemic and things like that but we talk about that topic area so much and we exacerbate the importance of getting help for it yet there is a correlating illness in regards to the prevalence and its um, incidence rate that is just totally swept under the rug um, and just flying under the radar and that one shocked me quite a lot so for like an illness of equal prevalence um and cause for concern it's definitely not valued in the same way um especially even mentioning it in educational purposes and programs and things like that um i know that even in my undergrad um and i did sports science um an exercise and we spoke a lot about the other end of the spectrum but maybe even a slide on it wasn't even necessarily well it said eating disorders but it was very blasé no way near the extent of what people should know about it um and the severity of it too i feel like it was just sort of brushed over and that's not okay okay so we're gonna get a little bit more specific now for the next point um so nice has stated there to be around 266,300 people aged 16 and over with anorexia nervosa accounting for a respective 0.6% of the population. Um, so if we break down this a little bit more, um, research, research has shown that the most affected age group um, seems to be between 15 and 19 years old. Um, and I think what's important to consider here is the data accessibility um, we have and how that's projected. And this is what I was sort of talking about, about how we interpret statistics. Um, so essentially what i mean by this point is that by law um those who fall under the age of 18 um your parents legal guardians or carers um can consent for you to either be admitted to treatment or seek help even if you aren't willing to do so now this tends to be um accepted in life-threatening situations and exceptional circumstances um whereas after 18 over that age unless challenged or legally changed you have the full rights um, and responsibility to see, seek help for yourself, um, whether that's to do with treatment or going to the doctors, things like that. And so although like this statistic um, does include 18 to 19 year olds um, in that range, there is most likely a lot of underreported or underrecorded cases um, that don't fully measure um, the degree of suffering in other age groups. Um, not to say that isn't a true statistic because I did in fact become ill or my illness did become more apparent um, when I was 12. Um, that's sort of when I can remember when it started happening. But on from this point, like it even states that inpatient care, most commonly, um, in fact, over half um, admitted patients are aged 15 for girls and 13 for boys, um, with even children as young as five being admitted. This is a mental health issue that can become prevalent whenever um, and in very, very young children. This is why we'll get onto the point of um, intervention and time of intervention as well, which is significant in, I guess, the likelihood in recovery from this illness. But, but on to the point in regards to receiving treatment and treatment itself, unfortunately, um, a study that was conducted in 2012 reported only an estimate of 23% of people actually were receiving treatment. Now, although this is pretty much 10 years old, um, I did actually find this in a 2019 publication and this was in a position statement by uh, the Royal College of Psychiatrics, which either highlights a really bad thing in the sense of 
there's very limited follow-up and these are the only figures that we are going by 10 year old figures um, which is not ideal 10 years is a very long time and if this is the, the only values that we have and if we consider as well the pandemic and the necessity for treatment and the effect that that has had on the statistics or the prevalence of eating disorders over just that small period of time um this should ring alarm bells and this is something that we need to be following up and chasing I don't know whether it does mean that, but then also I don't know whether it's been put into things for effect of trying to push forward for things or whether that's again just giving us um, information to prove a point. But the fact that that is the only statistic that can be given um, and I can't find anything more up to date in that sense, it's pretty shocking. And especially referring back to the pandemic as well, how much the necessity of it is um, and yeah, it, that's not ideal. I could be totally wrong. Um, it's obviously not as black and white as, as that in that respect, but definitely not ideal. And a good example of this actually um, is the following filing of it was over 19,000 hospital admissions for eating disorders were reported between 2018 and 2019, which is a 37% increase from 2016, 2017, um, which was around 14,000 cases. Um, so if we look at it um, and then consider the impact of the COVID pandemic, as I've said, um, whilst hospital admissions may not be as possible um, during this period of time because of isolation and things like that, um, the prevalence and severity of eating disorders can be suggested to have increased significantly um, during this period. So just in that single period, how can you expect those other figures in regards to um, receiving treatment not to have changed over a 10 year period? I'm just saying, just making a point there. And this is why it's so important to talk about this stuff because none of this is really put out there and I don't really understand why. On to the next point, which I think is um, quite an interesting one. Um, and I'll probably go on a little bit of rant on this, but uh, average duration of um, an eating disorder. Now, according to what's put out there, the average duration, um, so they say is six years. For me, I feel like there needs to be a lot more refinement as to what that actually means. Um, so by that, I mean from diagnosis. So in regards to like what defines the point where it starts and the point where it ends and who determines that, what is the assessment for that? And whether you're looking at that from the sufferer's interpretation of when it started or when it becomes severe, of like the severity increases, when is that? And also the fact that recovery or eating disorders in general, it's not like a linear thing in regards to your progression over time. You can have really, really good moments and then it could be that five years down the line, something triggers it or it, uh, you have very overwhelming moments and you relapse. So I don't think it's fair to say that time is always, time means that you're just gonna keep getting better and better and better because you might come where you, you are progressing, but then something happens and things kind of go spiraling a little bit. So it's really difficult to dis determine the start and the end point. I don't know how they're assessing that to say the eating disorder is approximately six years old six years long now whilst like i guess it's important to know as well though because i feel like it does still prove an important point in that it's not just a sh not necessarily not necessarily shall we say just a short-term thing this is something that can affect both the sufferer and friends family carers loved ones whoever that is also involved um and i think that in itself still sh shows the severity of the illness um so in that respect i don't think it's a bad statistic to have but I do feel like clarification needs to be made on that especially with like um the terminology and the language that we use and there's another point I think that maybe after this in my script um that comes on to yeah like the words used and how that's assessed 
to the statement there was that less than half of the people who suffer um, from an eating disorder will make a full recovery. So again, just reiterating the point of when an eating disorder ends, um, and this is where sort of figures can be broken down a little bit um, in regards to the lifetime um, or the lifespan of a disorder. By no means am I saying that it's um, impossible to fully recover um, and not have it bother you ever again, because that's definitely happened. Um, it's been proven to be true. Um, and it's also shown to be more likely um, when early intervention is happening. So catching it early and breaking that cycle and sort of not allowing it to sort of grow in itself. Um, and that's been proven to be a lot more effective. Um, but I think it's important we make ourselves aware um, of the terminology that we use, like I've said, um, and the diagnoses that are given. Um, because while statistics say that, I mean, it's, it's not a great statistic in itself, but around 47% of patients uh, with anorexia were classified as cured, um, with this including 60% of adolescents and only 20 to 30% of adults in remission or making a full remission. Um, but the statement doesn't necessarily distinguish um, of those individuals that make up those statistics who experienced relapse, which would therefore technically um, put you place you in both values, if that sort of makes sense. So whilst we can give out some promising um, values, like the higher percentage in adolescence, um, I think it's important to be aware of what value or what that makes up, which, which is what I was sort of talking about earlier in the introduction, um, um, and what the value really signifies, and what other factors need to be considered within that statistic. Um, so, Things such as, like I said, time of intervention, the characteristics um, and the assessments used to determine what is cured and what is uh, in remission or recovery, things like that. Um, support provided and the cause of its development and the data accessibility, because sometimes people don't get recorded. Um, or reported medically um, and so and also like what we have access to um, can be a major issue so they are things that definitely need to be considered I don't want it I don't want to sound like I'm just fully critique critiquing um, but I do still think it's super important because people can read these values and be like oh they're really good um, when we need to have that sense of realism in that there are still massive issues here and no case is the same so whilst yes people have got better and people have improved and things have worked for people there are also a lot of things that need to be improved upon and should be considered for the future and now for sort of like my next point i actually wanted to draw attention now to some statistics um that are given around the detection and the treatment um which may help emphasize my previous points um, and actually be quite relatable to some of you um based on my own experience i know that this is something that had and has always bothered me and actually gets my fire burning more than anything um in some respects um, in regards to wanting to make changes um to the understanding um, the training and the treatment for anorexia and also being inclusive of other eating disorders too and it still shocks me every time <laughs> that i read this um and especially uh, like makes me super mad <laughs> which you'll probably um see as i sort of um go as we go through these videos and things um and yeah just really really grinds my ears about this so get ready for this so based on what i've been reading um the majority of patients um with eating disorders do not have access to evidence-based uh, effective treatment and this is something that i've said from the get-go that i want to do is bringing to light the scientific research the literature evidence-based um studies clinical trials things like that um and actually utilize that more to create a more efficient or constructive um, treatment pathway for anorexia specifically which hopefully will help in other eating disorders too and the process um, that we go through whilst there does need to be a flexibility based on the fact that with this it's not a one-size-fits-all principle like i said and that one thing may not work for someone whereas it was super useful for someone else um, and you know that all comes down to i guess the luck of the draw in some cases too in regards to who you receive um 
that helps you through treatment, um, in services and things like that, your support system, your characteristics as a person, um, and what works for you and what doesn't. Um, we all learn in different ways, as we know. Um, so that's something to always be mindful of, but I feel like it's really good to have a solid foundation of having that accessibility to people who can um, adapt appropriately um, to who they're dealing with to give them the most effective way of treatment, I guess. So that's something that is really important to me and it's listening to the sufferer um, in a way that allows you to help them in the most beneficial way, not to exacerbate their their condition because, or their illness, sorry, um, because when you're in it, as most of you um, will come to find, obviously, you're not necessarily always in your right frame of mind um, and you're sort of, um, the eating disorder sort of overrides overrides that and makes you do things that you should be doing to feed it I guess but you still have your own mind and not and you make sense and not everything has to be related to your eating disorder um and that's super important and that's something that I really found that I um was struggled I struggled with in the sense of no one was really hearing what I had to say for myself they always just kept me like well she's too ill to even like give a rational sentence which was just not the case at all so I think that's something that's really important and I think it's the quality of the service that is provided the quality of the um professional or the specialist or the whoever's in charge of you um which is something that we will definitely come to I think it's coming on in the next point in my <laughs> in my uh, thing so but this is something that I this is we'll get into it we'll get into it yeah not what not just one specific method will work for everybody which is why it's so important to um to yes be critical but not to the point where you're fully being out rollish to methods um because they do work for some people but it's just polishing that up um and making sure that people are going down the right route to be honest um and finding that before it's relatively too late we want to intervene as quickly as possible and find that route as quickly as possible and this this is the point that just reinstates it all to be honest this is the point that adds like grinds my gears like completely and i this would be really interesting if you guys have experienced this too because this all comes down to as well like time of intervention and knowledge education everything um, so, yeah, not happy about this one. <laughs> one third of eating disorder cases are detected by healthcare professionals, um, with only 15% of sufferers feeling like their GP understood part of what their eating disorder was. Oh, just like terrible. The thing is as well, there are guidelines and methods of assessment given to GP practices which clearly are not being looked at and I I fully understand the degree of stretch that um, GPs have and the pressure and things like that but it's not like good enough in a sense um, to not like give any light to this I think it's absolutely absurd I'm not saying that the whole world bloody evolves around um, this but a part of it definitely should. Um, and this is where we sort of fall in the category of like lostness because GPs don't necessarily know where to refer, do not have the resources to refer because they have no idea and doesn't really put much faith in like how you are and what you're feeling. Just to like highlight this even more, like GPs have also acknowledged their lack of understanding um, and most tend to go down the route of if someone walks in um, who said that they may be suffering from an eating disorder, they go down the route of, oh, let's just see how this goes and wait and see. Like, and obviously that's incredibly dangerous because we know that the longer you, you leave it, the more it manifests and it can happen very, very quickly. Just from a personal experience, um, the first time that my mum took me to the, to the hospital, to the doctors, um, when she, it sort of came to light that um, I may have an eating disorder um i think i got weighed by the nurse i think that was it maybe just wait 
height and weight I think I got um, and then the doctor came in and was just like your BMI is like low but it's not low enough for you to be to, to be concerned or for you to be considered that you have an eating disorder. Saying that to someone who had an eating disorder um, triggered me to be like oh great well I'm not ill enough so that must mean that I'm fine and that I will just continue what I'm doing and it sort of fueled the fire for me to like carry on spiraling um and 10 years down the line although I'm a lot better to where I was 100% I've been hospitalized I've fucking almost died um because of a misdiagnosis I'm not saying it's fully fully related but I mean I mean I know you can't, can't predict like how things sort of played out or anything but like can you imagine how different that could have been had the detection for it been better handled um and I think it's just very dangerous um not having that much knowledge on it and just being like oh we'll see how it goes bearing in mind it is a psychological disorder a mental health illness um yet I was my only method of assessment was physical um and looking at my weight and because I wasn't classified as underweight um or just having a low BMI that meant I was fine and I don't even think I got any recommendations I think it was just like oh we'll just keep monitoring it and see how we go like I said I don't want to like bash it all the time because again unfortunately as well like across the board like not everywhere is going to have the same service um that is available to them um and some gps may be more specialized in this area than others like it's not account for every gp doesn't know anything um, but the case of like um i think it's just important to let people know that what they could potentially be walking into and if this is something that you have experienced it'd be great to know and see how that how relatable that is and if you want to leave a comment below and discuss your experience that'd be really great because we can also put out the good things so i want to know as well like if you went to the gp and they were really on it and what they asked you and things like that it's really important that we do highlight the pros and the cons because like i said like facilities could be really good and we want to bring out those positive points so we can keep utilizing those if they're working um and formulate that into the structure of a better treatment plan um but I think it's just important to highlight um, those sort of things and what to look out for because if that does happen it may be worth being like okay we need to go somewhere else and like deal with this maybe go a bit more specialized um, and kind of direct it more to those people who sort of know a bit more about what they're talking about um, because it's not something that should be left um, and if we nip it in the bud as quick as we can hopefully it doesn't uh, spiral into something worse. But yeah, fully infuriate me was like crazy. And I just think their unwillingness to even learn about it is quite terrible, considering the day and age that we live in now as well, especially with social media, which never helps. Uh, okay, I say never. It hasn't been a useful tool in some respects. <laughs> we should just be, it's just not good enough. I keep saying it's not good enough because that's true, it's not good enough. So um, yeah, that's my rant for that. But this is something that I actually really want to talk about in a separate video because I feel like there is a lot to talk about on this sort of area um, in regards to like GP services, the methods of assessment used um, and what is actually given to um, practices um, in regards to the training um, and what they should be doing if someone thinks they have an eating disorder and things like that and resources. And we're going to hold a different video on that because there's a lot to talk about in terms of that and the stuff that i read just needs to be put into the universe because i think you've got to weigh up are you wasting your time going to the gp for that specific reason is there a better source possibly so i think it's important that we see where we're going with these routes um and making it a lot more beneficial to us i think irregardless i think more so the point of like you could get a really good quality service but the waiting time and the transition periods are a lot longer or waiting whatever um, is a lot longer or you could get a really shit service and still have a long time to wait so it's really really difficult um to sort of establish what's good and what's bad in that respect um 
but it'd be really interesting to still know your points of view on this um, and if this is something that you'd be interested in me discussing um, and what you feel like I could necessarily draw from in regards to anything to do with the GP services. I'm going to move on to um, probably one of the most morbid points but has to be discussed. Um, anorexia causes more deaths than any other mental health disorder, um, having a mortality rate of 5.1 deaths per thousand persons. One in five um, of deaths um, from anorexia are due to suicide. Um, and these figures were taken from a publication in 2017 and it mentioned previously about the pandemic. I can only imagine that these figures have escalated significantly. Again, I think it draws back to the point of points of call that we have, um, at the available and the accessibility um, and the importance of improving communications between services um, and the duration of processing treatment. Um, and almost a quarter of the UK services take more than two months to arrange an initial assessment of bed support and about 10% um, between the initial assessment and actual treatment. More worryingly so, it's been estimated that only 23 percent of people actually receive treatment which again is what I said earlier um, but just reiter reiterating the point of you look at the figures and while some percentages think oh that's quite good you actually see who comes into treatment and the success rates of that not accounting for relapse or anything like that these are the things that we need to consider um, and actually look at the realism of what we're being what we're being told now this is something that I kind of touched upon when I was talking about um, my experience in regards to after my hospital um, hospitalisation, um, the treatment plan after, and position statements have actually flagged this as a massive cause for concern and something that needs to be dealt with um, in a lot more of an efficient way. And it's most likely to override any progressions made during treatment, to be honest. Um, and that is the quality um, and readiness of follow-up uh, plans put in place. So a lot of patients are sort of left in this limbo between like coming out of um, treatment and obviously being at home. Um, and this is a very vulnerable stage, um, which as I've said, can undo a lot of progress because if you're sort of left not really knowing what to do, um, it's really hard to adjust to sort of reality because obviously when you're inpatient, it's not a realistic every day necessarily, if that makes sense, because you've got so many other variables in the outside world. Oh my God, that thing that freaks me out. So yeah, like I wasn't really like, we had a sit down conversation at the end of my treatment and they were like saying all these things about what we're gonna do after and things like that. Um, and they said that I had to come back for a week just as day patient, um, which I was reluctant to at first. And then I was like, okay, fine. And then when I did it, they didn't realize I was there. So their way of like, th there was just no structure. And I just felt very, very lost. And in my experience, I actually probably got the, the worst that I ever have been after hospital. Um, so, and this is why I say about how recovery isn't necessarily linear. Like I went downhill because there was no, I got to this point and there was like no help for it after and I didn't know what to do in, in regards to like how much to eat. I didn't get a meal plan or anything like that. Um, obviously my family had to take over from everything. Um, and you know, it doesn't just, life doesn't just stop for them either. Like they've got work commitment that they have to do to get money. Um, just being in the environment, a different environment, you've got, you've got, you're kind of more exposed to things such as looking at calories. Um, and things like that. And you can just, because you're sort of, to a degree, monitoring yourself a little bit more um, and eyes aren't necessarily always on you, you're a little bit more active, um, little things creep back in and then it just like can take over everything. Um, so yeah, I had no like psychological therapy either after that just kind of stopped, even though mine was pretty rubbish during the time as well, um, just nothing. And I was at a massive, huge loss. So like, it just felt like everything that I'd done was pointless and it felt like, oh, well, I've just been left. No one really gives a shit. So maybe I shouldn't give a shit. Like that kind of headspace. Um, because whilst we say about, whilst obviously physically increasing weight and things is definitely very, very important in this. And I'm not undermining that at all. But again, it's forgetting the psychological side 
clearly I wasn't recovered in my, in my mind um, and this is where um, the distortion between like I guess weight restoration a lot of people associate that with being cured um, and that's a whole other thing that we can go into but just making the point of like mentally clearly I was not very well still so um yeah it's um that is something that is really really obviously affecting um recovery rates and a massive problem okay so whilst I haven't covered all the figures um, and you probably see me looking at the screen like this the whole bloody time and I I can only apologize but if there are points that you feel like I haven't raised or statistics that you feel uh, should be strongly um brought to light then please leave it in the comments below because like i said i'm not going to hit everything every single time and i'm still learning too as i go um and we really want to push this as much as we can um and if you've got questions about what i've said in this um or if things are like wrong or whatever um <laughs> please just comment below um this is about bringing this to the forefront like i said as much as possible and um this is about being a community and helping each other out um and if we can do that the best way that we can and that is through the communication then we've got to do it there are many points that i want to expand upon and stuff um but if there are things that i've said in this or i haven't said in this that you would like me to expand upon then please do please again put it down in the comments and i will do my best to kind of bring them to light as best as i can or like speak about them as best I can and I'm not very good at speaking at the moment um, and I just get lost in my rage or whatever I do <laughs> but the more that we discuss the more that we can change um and yeah I really hope that you have enjoyed this video um and I am doing this um area justice um because all I want is to like just project the importance of treatment for anorexia and other eating disorders too but also give people their own voice. And if I can sort of voice things for people, then I'm happy to. Um, obviously, as long as, well, obviously, but I'm gonna project what I believe in, um, give sort of critique and then give positives, negatives, things like that. But I just want to help those who are suffering. Um, that includes loved ones, family, friends, um, and the training and how it's put into education and things like that so yeah i'm just trying to do the best in that respect and hopefully i'll get better um at talking and explaining myself so i'm really sorry that it's not amazing yet um but i promise you i have the passion for this um this this area and i'm like i i really really want to do this justice and hopefully get things moving more so with this but yeah but if you'd like to stick around and watch me waffle on for many days um stick around for the journey so please smash this a huge thumbs up and give it a like and subscribe i mean smash it thumbs up and like is the same thing right please give this video a huge thumbs up and subscribe to my channel um as it really supports what we're driving for um but thank you again and i really appreciate you appreciate it. really appreciate you sticking around um and i look forward to seeing you in another video i mean i won't see you you'll just see me so that's a good way to end this um <laughs> but yes i hope you have a lovely day evening afternoon wherever you are um and i will see you in the next video